Welcome to WP Tonic, episode 147. And today, we've got not one guest, but two guests. We've got Justin Busa and Robbie McCullough from Beaver Builder. Uh, Justin, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Hey, guys. I'm uh, Justin with Beaver Builder, uh, Fastline Media, parent company. And uh, I've been uh, building websites for quite a while now on WordPress, I guess since 2009 on WordPress, and then uh, eventually started Beaver Builder with uh, Robbie and uh, Billy, who may have heard of in our community. And uh, that's where we're at now. Excellent. Robbie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hey, guys. My name is Robbie McCullough. I'm uh, one of the other co-founders of Beaver Builder. Uh, let's see. I live in the Bay Area, and I've been working with Justin and Billy for several years now, and and um, yeah, really, really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Oh, we are glad to have you. I also want to introduce my co-host, uh, Jonathan. Tell oh, us. hi. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, hi there, folks. I'm the founder of WP Tonic. We're a maintenance support company, and we also offer um, services to developers, designers that are got projects and they're looking for a trusted partner that, that can be a white label partner on their internal projects. Excellent. And I am John Locke. My business is Lockdown Design, and I help blue collar businesses with their WordPress sites and specifically helping them with their local SEO and WooCommerce integrations. Uh, you know, like every good product has an origin story. What is the origin story? for Beaver Builder? How did it come about? What did it come out of? It was a, yeah, it was kind of a fun one. So, so Justin and Billy, well, Justin and Billy have a kind of fun origin story I could tap on quickly. Yeah, do it. Um, I met them through Craigslist, but they'd been in business for a few years before I came on board. And prior to all that, um, Justin was playing in a local band and Billy uh, used to manage the local club in town, and that's how they they met. So it was kind of uh, you know rock and roll brought brought those two together. I like <laughs> it's always kind of a fun one. Um, but then yeah, I came on a couple of years later, and we were doing strictly client services. We were doing a lot of websites for photographers, and then um, through that we started kind of transitioning more into the small local businesses and and basically anything we could get our hands on. Um, and then Beaver Builder started off as. Uh, project we were working on internally for our own use in our agency. Um, we'd kind of, we, we had built a client site um, using a page builder on the request of the client. We were kind of of the, the philosophy that, you know, like uh, who wants to use a page builder? We're developers, like we can do it ourselves. Um, but we had a client that wanted to use one. And so we built his site with them and then handed it off and we were like, oh, wow, like, this is actually kind of a nice way to do it. Like, it saved us some time, and then he's taking care of the changes himself. Um, and that was where we kind of got the spark or the idea to start building one um, that was you know, perfect for what we needed. And then from there, we decided to, to productize it. Very good. Uh, you know, in, in making that transition from doing straight client services to being a product business, now, what were kind of the challenges that you faced, um, you know, making Beaver Builder the center of your business? And was that even intentional? Do you want to, you want to jump into that one, Justin? Or I yeah, no, I, yeah, I can, I can definitely speak on that. I think the challenge is really finding the time or balancing the time because the client work has to get done. And especially when the product isn't, you know, when it's in its infancy and it's not supporting the business, the client works supporting the product. Um, but, you know, as the product starts to grow, there's, you know, things like support and, you know, it's not going to grow without marketing. So you start to have to invest more and more time. So it's definitely a balancing act to get to that point. Um, but at the end of the day, the client work still has to get done because, you know, you need to put your, you know, we're feeding our families with this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so you can't just completely neglect it. And then... Um, you know, the, the transition, I think, for us, it went really smooth because uh, Robbie and uh, Billy took a lot of st uh, stuff off my plates uh, early on so I could focus almost 100% on Beaver Builder. They would, you know, in the mornings, we'd jump into support and Beaver Builder, you know, related emails and things like that and then get to client work. But uh, as time went on, 
uh, I was able to, you know, do that all day long, do development all day long. Support was pretty easy in the early going. So it wasn't like, you know, these days where, you know, we actually need a team of people. It was just a couple hours in the morning. And then um, eventually um, it, we, we, you know, decided to pull the trigger. And that's when uh, it, Beaver Builder had started actually supporting itself. And, and Billy and Robbie said, okay, we're going to, we're going to shut down the client work too. And we started um, finding new homes for our clients and phasing out, taking on new projects and things like that. So, and how do you know, you know, when that tipping point is there um, and how, you know, is it scary like pulling that trigger and just saying like, we're just going to put all our chips in on this product and we're just going to do away with client work altogether. Like how terrifying is that? It's pretty terrifying. Um, you know, especially since even with the client services stuff, like we slowed down at one point um, quite a bit uh, during our, our time doing that, that even that was scary. So jumping in the product was kind of like doing that again, like, oh my gosh, you know, like, are we going to be able to do this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty scary. And I mean, I, I think the tipping point though is really just, you know, when you, when you, when the signs point to that it's going to work out, I don't think that money necessarily means that it's going to work out. I mean, money's a big factor and it obviously it needs to be bringing in some, some revenue, but um, you know, signs in like the community and the product growth and things like that. And let's see, this is going to be viable long-term rather than, Oh, we're just going to, you know, sell this product for, you know, it's doing really great now, but is it going to do great in a couple months? So the longevity I think is like knowing that that longevity is there is a big tipping point, I think. Um, but yeah, either way, it's still scary. I mean, you rely on this client services business and you have all these relationships for so many years and then you just say, shut it down completely. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It definitely it's, felt like a risk at the time. Yeah. I know when we started out and I've seen this now in a couple other products that have, that have popped up, but you'll get the, the early adopters like quote unquote. And so we were really lucky to have a, you know, really healthy group of, of early adopters that, you know, the kind of folks that were out there just trying everything and loved to play with new tools and new products. And then, you know, a few months or a year in, we started having more and more people that were using Beaver Builder. And a lot of people were using Beaver Builder for their agencies and actually building their businesses around our business. And seeing that happen um, was a little bit, you know, gave us a little bit of a sense of security that it wasn't just kind of people jumping in and giving us a try and moving on to something else, that there, there might be something long-term there. We were also having a whole lot of fun doing product and we were all kind of not burnt out, but you know, client work was getting a little repetitive and this, this was this kind of brand new world. So that, that made it a little easier that we were having a blast uh, making the transition. <laughs> yeah, well, especially being a follow. developer. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, go. for, to Robbie's point, uh, being a developer, yeah, I mean, I was having a lot more fun building something for myself than for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so definitely here's a, here's a follow-up question, you know, to, to what you just said is, you know, it, it really started getting traction. You, you uh, saw agencies using it for their work, and they were building, like, their business around yours. Uh, was that something that you – was that a, a segment of the market that you were targeting right away, or was that just something that just happened to click? Or, you know, how did you, how did you market Beaver, Beaver Builder in the early days? Yeah, so we did kind of early on identify that since we had built Beaver Builder for our agency and kind of tuned it for that purpose of, of being a good framework to build a lot of sites on top of and then in turn hand off – to other people to manage, um, we knew, or, or yeah, we knew we were doing well in that in that market. And then we also figured, being a drag and drop page builder, that it would also do well with kind of do it yourselfers or beginners or people that didn't have a coding background. Um, I remember one of the first like purchases that we ever made for Beaver Builder. Like one of the first things we ever spent money on outside of hosting and some of like the regular stuff was we hired an agency to to do a explainer video. It's still the video we have on our homepage. Um, but I, I remember we specifically did two versions of the video with two different intros. And one of them was 
kind of saying, hey, like you just spent all this time building a website for a client and now they, you know, are coming back and asking for changes, da da da. And then the other version of the video started off with like, hey, you know, you need to build a website, but you don't know how to write code and it's a, you know, big mess and you don't know what you're doing. So we, we, we had that early on. Um, I think we were expecting, or I think we tried to target the do-it-yourselfers a little bit more in the beginning, um, thinking like that's the bigger market, you know, like that's where the that's where we should go. But then it's it, we're we're actually coming back around and realizing that I think our core one of our core segments is agencies and and freelancers and people that are building sites, you know, on a regular basis. What what kind of stuff did you do to uh, you know get the product in front of people uh, at first? Yeah, it was tough for a long time. You know, it. I, I like the snowball analogy because you know it started off really, really slow, and we were pushing. Well, I guess we weren't pushing hard. Like the snowball analogy doesn't work as far as like pushing it down the road. But yeah, it started off really, really, really slow. Um, we, you know, reached out to everyone we could. Really, we sent a ton of emails. I, you know, heard back from hardly anyone. We were trying to like inject ourselves into the conversation and blog comments and and. You know, there was all those kind of the top 10 page builders and we'd jump in in the comments and say, hey, we're, you know, these new guys come check us out. And, um, you know, it's always like a really delicate process because you don't want to come off as spammy and you don't want to tick people off. And and I'm sure we did at some point to some degree. But, I, yeah, doing that and then um, one of our early customers, too, was a guy that had a, a background in marketing um, which the three of us, none of us were really marketers. And he came in and gave us a lot of advice. Um, we, we launched with a different name originally. Our, our agency and the parent company, like Justin mentioned, is Fastline Media. And so we called it Fastline Page Builder. And he kind of jumped in and said, oh, you guys need to change your name. Like, you need to learn how to write copy. You need to figure out, you know, your, your segment. All these things that we're, we're kind of learning about and trying to do now, a lot of that was inspired by him. Um, and we, then we realized that he was just reading Chris Lemma's blog and kind of like regurgitating all <laughs> Chris Lemma's stuff. And we're like, oh man, we know, you know, this guy's nice and all, but we're going to go and like, you know, read all of Chris's books and Chris's stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, Chris, we, so someone, well, it, it's a whole nother long story, but yeah, Chris, Chris found out about us relatively early on and, and gave us a really good endorsement. And that added a whole new layer to the snowball and things really started to pick up. Um, once he started talking about us. Yeah. And to add to that too, like we, we've kind of been making this up as we're going along. Like, I mean, we we're a lot more knowledgeable now. We've, we've actually been learning quite a bit over the last, like almost three years now, three years next year. Um, but we had no clue what we were doing. Uh, I mean, e even, even on the business side, you know, I mean, we, we were just technically three freelancers working together that uh, we got a lot of work because we worked really hard and we did good work and we just got a lot of referrals. I think that's kind of how Beaver Builder, the, the snowball kind of slowly started, is that we trans, or that same kind of uh, work ethic and, and mentality uh, we brought over to the product side, both in how we developed it and how we supported it. And so a lot of our early evangelists kind of helped get that snowball going. And then until some of the, you know, we got some more bigger press um, that really, like Robbie was saying, got it to take off. Yeah. No, definitely the power <laughs> of network is is huge. But I, yeah. I, but I think the name and the mascot, definitely, that's like, yeah. I mean, that makes it just all the more memorable. It helped cut through the noise for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, as you started to see Beaver Builder grow, um, you know, there is other third-party developers that started contributing, um, you know, uh, extensions to Beaver Builder. Were you surprised when you started to see that happen? And, and, you know, what's your thoughts about that? Um, I, I don't know if I was necessarily surprised. I was, I was like, um, flattered, if anything, um, that someone would do something like that. The, uh, the fact that it was happening, though, I, I think I kind of saw coming because um, just through support and, like, what people were wanting to do with Beaver Builder, um, I get a lot of requests to make it more extensible um, early on. Like we didn't even have like a, a lot of our documentation or our things available that made it extensible. So it's, as requests started coming in for that kind of thing, I'd be like, oh yeah, sure. Like I want it to, you know, I want you to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, so it was really like a community effort to, to get it to 
the point to where it's actually as extensible as it is from you know day one to to now um but yeah no i mean we definitely surprised too because like we're working on a big ui redesign right now because we had no idea that this many people would be building add-ons um so like the current ui just doesn't support um you know all these different things that people are trying to do so now that we've seen what people are doing and we've learned from customer feedback over the years we're trying to start to like to think that way so um yeah it, it definitely wasn't something we were expecting and it's definitely uh you know it's pretty awesome to see that happen with your product it's like with the third-party developers are you in uh, a lot of constant communication with them just telling them where you're going next or do they reach out to you or how's that work um they both, yeah, they'll reach out to us and uh, I've reached out with them. Uh, I'll share, as I'd like, for example, some of the bigger ones, I've shared some of our ideas on stuff we're going to be thinking about the new UI. Um, and they're pretty active in our Facebook group too. So um, whenever they're chatting about something that's interesting um, in terms of like an idea for like the product, like I'll jump in there and, and chat with them on that too. I have a bunch of notes that I've gotten just from those little conversations. Um, so yeah, it's, there's definitely an open line of communication there with the um, more active um, third-party developers for sure. If I can, yeah, take the opportunity to to like broadcast this out. We'd love to talk to more people and hear what more people are doing before because there have been a couple cases where you know we've seen a product or someone has launched something that we didn't know they were working on, which kind of overlaps with some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, so yeah, and we're happy to kind of discuss. We try and well, we've been learning how to how to announce our roadmap and how to kind of most effectively manage that. And there's some things we love to talk about that we're doing. There's some things that we don't want to get people, you know, excited about before we know we can actually pull them off. So there's you know we're we're pretty transparent with what we're doing um, for the most part. But there's a couple things that we kind of have to keep under wraps. And yeah, we're happy to share that. If anyone's you know thinking about making a product for Beaver Builder, let us know, and we can you know let you know if it's going to overlap or what we think, and if it kind of falls into line with the direction we're trying to go. No, oh, very cool. And uh, something you mentioned too, like you know you have an active Facebook group. Um, you know, building a community around a product. You know, what are the challenges that you've uh, found doing that? How difficult or how easy is it to, to build a community around a product and make it consistent? We got, yeah, we got really fortunate, um, like going back to the discussion on marketing, I, I should have touched on this more, but yeah, we got really fortunate to, to have a really, you know, passionate fan base of people. Um, you know, so we, uh, we used to have a support forum right now. We, we use help scout, but we used to have a public forum and, when people would type, you know, ask questions in the forum, a lot of times someone else would pop in another, you know, one of our customers or users would pop in and answer it for them and um, for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, so but back to your question, communities are, are, are interesting, right? Because uh, like long before WordPress and all this, I, I used to have a, a online discussion board that I, I set up. That was kind of what one of my first web projects. And, you know, anyone that set up a forum or a Facebook page or even a blog, like it's always the same thing. Like you're just trying to get people in um, and it's so difficult. I remember in the forum days, we'd like, I'd had like 20 different accounts with different names and I'd have little conversations with myself to try and see discussions. <laughs> and then if you're, you know, lucky enough to kind of get over that break where there's other people coming in, then it becomes a management and like almost like a political um, challenge, you know, because you're always going to, you know, like you have disagreements or you're going to have people that want to post, you know, links to their product. Like how much do you let people just manage themselves? And, and um, so th th luckily, again, we've got such a great community. That's not much of an issue that we have to deal with. But, but yeah, from time to time, we kind of, the, you know, post will pop up and we'll kind of like scratch our heads and go, oh, I don't know if this is what we want to do. Like what maybe we should, <laughs> we might need to cut this off or... <laughs> Yeah, I'll just I'm say, gonna... based on uh, just what I've seen from other groups, not like all Facebook groups are bad or anything, but I do feel like we have like a um, a pretty even keel community where you don't see a lot of those like heated discussions or you know even things that need to be moderated so much. It's um, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously, <laughs> as it grows, but it's just a lot of people helping each other and and you know discussing the product and WordPress in general. 
No, excellent. I, I think it's time for our first break. Uh, and then when we come back, we're going to be talking more with Justin Busa and Robbie McCullough of Beaver Builder back in a second. We're coming back from our break and we're talking with Robbie McCullough and Justin Busa of Beaver Builder. Uh, you know, before the break, we were talking about building a community and knock on wood, like so far you haven't had, uh, you know, uh, problems with, uh, you know, moderating stuff like that. Uh, when it comes to uh, moderating the community, uh, say like in the Facebook group or anything like that, do you have like people that you kind of assign, you know, the moderator role to besides yourselves, uh, people that kind of police it for you? <laughs> Yeah, interestingly, the the gentleman who started the group, we we actually weren't. I wish they, I could take credit for it, but um, the our Facebook group in particular, which is kind of the most active hub of our community, was started by one of our our users. His name's Dave, and I remember, yeah, way back when I I sent him a message and I was like, hey, Dave, this is really cool. Thanks for doing this. You know, if you can bring us on as admins, just so we know that we have some control of this, if things go awry or, you know, we, we, we'd love to promote this. Like it was kind of an agreement that he let us in as uh, admins on the group. And then we started to push it and tried to get as many people in there as we could because it was such a cool, cool resource. Um, yeah, the one I'd love to start. Well, like Justin mentioned, we have we don't really have an issue where, for some reason, yeah, I've been parts of other groups where they are constantly getting spammed, um, or you know, have having discussions like trolls and all the worst kind of things you can find on the internet. And we've gotten been really lucky that we haven't had to do a lot of moderating. Um, and I think a lot of that is is Dave um, and his his judgment and, and judge of character when he's letting people into the group. He does a lot of pre-screening, I think, um, as far as like keeping spammers out. But uh, it's mostly the the three of us. And a couple of our our support folks are, are regulars in there now. We haven't opened up like the moderator role to many people outside of our um, the company. And then Dave, although maybe we should now that I'm saying it out loud. Uh, there's no reason. There's a lot of people in there I could think of that would be great that spend. You know a lot of time in there and know the community really well so yeah maybe we should do that <laughs> definitely jonathan you have a question yeah i was just thinking about the conversation and um i'm going to change my question i was going to ask you guys um a page builder you know um it's it's not an easy thing to build you know there's a lot of page builders out there and i feel your one is very clearly the best product on, at the present moment in that area by a long what was there a, a technical um like javascript or some technology that came on the scene that enabled you to build a product like this that enabled you because it's so clearly a lot better than a lot of and there's a lot of page builders out there and i'm not trying to discount them but it's very clearly that yours um or was it just um interface design and the fault pattern that came in the actual development process or a bit of both oh i think on the technology side um it's really just advancements in WordPress itself. Um, the technology's all all kind of been there. And when you're looking at like you know JavaScript and PHP and and HTML and CSS, I mean you could have really built something like this years ago. Oh right. That, that, that technology hasn't. I mean it's advanced in ways, but I mean the, the base of it's still you know more or less the same. You could could figure it out, but just some of the stuff that you could do with WordPress um, now that you couldn't do like five you know years ago or I mean, I could say 10 years ago, WordPress is only three years old. It definitely would have been a lot harder. But <clears throat> um, so, yeah, no, I mean, just, you know, uh, WordPress itself. I mean, because, you know, people have talked about like, oh, you know, couldn't you build, like, just take the builder and build it for another platform? But it's really like coupled with, for better or for worse, um, but it's really coupled with things that like WordPress allows you to do and it makes it really easy. Like some other plugins, for example, like have all these like complicated like SQL queries and things like that. And, you know, they're doing all this kind of stuff, but we really just like try to let WordPress do as much as it can in the background um, and just like leverage, leverage what 
WordPress gives us um, since we're building on top of it. So um, I'd have to, I'd have to definitely say that it's that. And then also too, I mean, just in terms of like what we built as a page builder versus what people are building as a page builder, like five plus years ago, um, even, you know, the I mean, visual composer was really like the only one. There's a lot of the back end builders and things like that. <clears throat> I think when we're talking about the user interface, it's just stuff we learned from building websites and being exposed to different types of website builders um, on different platforms, you know, everything from Squarespace and Wix to the, you know, one off different little things and even WordPress page builders themselves, um, just being an agency and seeing all these different things. Um, what Beaver Builder became was like kind of a culmination of our experience um, with all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, a little bit of both, definitely. That was a really interesting answer because I thought you were going to say it's advanced, but really fundamentally it is WordPress and the advances in WordPress coupled with your own experience of using other products combined that's a, that enabled you to build this product initially. So that's, I think that's a fascinating answer. Thank you, Just. Oh, yeah, um, so um, another one that follows is that um, I totally understand that you would have thought it, you know, because of uh, Wix and other similar products, you think you aim your product at those that want to do it all themselves. But then you've come to the um, realization through the, um, the development of the product and the history of the company that a lot of your users are agencies. And I, um, I said this to John in one of our episodes, you know, this idea, you know, people say, well, it's only a marketing site. Well, um, you, anybody, probably anybody could go on to Wix and knock something up, but actually get a result from it. Actual business result is a, a, a another total area, isn't it, John? Uh, um, so, um, when did you start to realise that your, your your target audience wasn't quite who you thought it was, that it was actually other agencies and developers? When did that start to happen? I think that was probably pretty early on, just because we, like Robbie had said, we built it for ourselves. Um, I think we wanted to target a broader audience, but we, we always knew that that was still part of our segment. Um, also for me personally, and this goes back to before I, like when I was just getting started, I was working for, uh, uh, kind of unique niche market, uh, wedding album design. Well, just album design in general, um, these custom designs. It was really big back in the day. Um, it's, you know, print labs are offering that stuff for free now and no one really wants like the fancy smancy stuff that people were paying like 10 bucks a page for. Um, <clears throat> but back then my boss, uh, used to say that when this automated stuff would come out and in these like page, these drag and drop like kind of tools for album design, cause we were using Photoshop and there's all these automated tools come out and I'd be like, Oh no, we're going to go out of business. And he's like, no, we're not. He's like, no one wants to do this themselves. Um, and I, and I feel the same way about website design and website builders. Like, you know, small businesses don't really want to build a website themselves. You know, I mean, a lot of the ones going to Wix and Weebly and Squarespace is cause you know, they're bootstrapping and they're starting up, but once they start getting a budget and they start getting serious about online marketing, it's not just about like, okay. you know, the website builder is just a tool. Um, who cares what it's built on <clears throat> at that point for the small business. So um, yeah, to kind of circle back around to it. Um, I always kind of back in my agents that, you know, those are the people building websites and they're not going to just stop building websites because there's a bunch of DIY builders out there. So there's always going to be agencies to, you know, have that well, kind of for. Well, really, the situation is very similar to when desktop publishing came out. Everybody thought they were going to do it themselves, and yeah. there is an element of that. But also, a lot of people learned very quickly is what kind of standard you get from um, and how many hours and time. You've got to be very time-rich and very um, probably very um, money-poor to build something that's really effective. So that's fantastic. So there's my couple of questions, John. You got your next question, John? Yes, I do. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned too, um, you know, as you grew, uh, support wasn't that, didn't take up that much time. But at this point, you're, you have a whole team of support. Um, how does, you know, product support look as compared to 
you know, when you're doing support for client services and, and how do you scale that up? How do you know when to grow and, and how do you choose people to be part of your support team? Not too bad. Billy's not here. He runs the uh, support team. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot more insight. <laughs> um, well, okay. I think we, gosh, that's good. It's a good question. Um, we, we grew it organically in that, you know, we were doing as much as we could. Um, like, well, so yeah, back, like circling back a few years when we were doing client services and the product at the same time, you know, there reached a point where we'd always come in in the morning and do support first and we'd kind of sit there and uh, we'd have a shared inbox and we'd kind of say, okay, I got this one. You get that one. We'll get that one. And, you know, we'd knock out the support in an hour and then Billy and I would jump into our client projects and Justin would jump into coding. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we'd, we'd be going until like 11 in the afternoon doing support. And then we were going until lunchtime doing support. And then we'd, you know, it'd be two o'clock in the afternoon and we were still knocking out support. Um, neglecting our client projects because we were having so much fun like working on beaver builder and i think that was when we realized like oh man we need to bring someone else in um and then going back to the whole so we we've done some consulting work with chris and we were you know kind of chris lemma followers we pay attention one of his big things is is learning how to delegate and that's one of the things we've been trying to learn as we've been growing the business is how to you know, get out of the, you know, working in the business to working on the business. Or am I, maybe, am I saying that wrong? Is it working on? And, and, but either way, like learning that, pro, like trying to separate ourselves as much as we can from the, the tasks that we can have someone else do um, to give us more time to, to work on the things that, you know, we really wouldn't be able to, to source out. Nope. Makes a lot of sense. As, as you grow, you do have to, and that, that's pretty consistent with a lot of the people that we talk to is like, as their business grows, they um, go from doing 100% like, you know, day-to-day -day tasks to like less and less. Um, it's and, it's and a challenge, to... yeah. And I remember, sorry, you mentioned like how we, how we pick people um, yeah. at, at first. Um, I think our first hire came from Upwork. And I know when you ask people about using, what did Upwork, Upwork used to be called something else that has a lot more familiar name. Elance. Oh, yes. Elance, yeah. Okay, so... Oh, yeah everyone has their horror stories working with freelancers, you know, on these, on these kind of sites. But I, I feel like we just got super fortunate. And the first guy we brought on, um, his name's Ben and he was just a rock star. He was really good, really knew his, his, he had really good technical chops and he was also just a really, um, personable guy. Like he, he fit in with our kind of our, uh, you know, the, the attitude and the, and the empathy that we wanted to project, he just fit it perfectly. And he's still with us today. Uh, and I do, I feel like we really got lucky there because you hear a lot of horror stories. And then one of our second hires was actually his brother. His brother was looking for a job around the same time we were looking for, for someone else. So we brought his brother on. So now we got the whole family thing going, which is cool. Um, and now that we've grown, a lot of our support hires have actually come out of our community or, um, we've been lucky enough to, to get a couple of people from other WordPress companies in a similar space. Um, one of which I don't want to mention, but you might've heard the okay. story about how they stopped paying their support people for a couple of months and uh, Got it. Yeah, their product was starting to kind of look a little bit, a little bit shoddy uh, or not shoddy, but yeah, was the, the future of it was looking a little iffy, um, but we got really fortunate to yeah, would bring some people in from the community and bring some people in from the greater WordPress community. There you go. Um, so here's a question too, you know, when you're working on new versions of Beaver Builder, when you're, you know, iterating there, how much testing do you do against, you know, some of the more, you know, popular plugins? Do you, you know, test against, do you have like a list of ones that you, test to make sure that everything's compatible. Um, you know, what does that look like? There's nothing, um, <clears throat> I would like to have something a little more automated. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but, but for uh, a lot of its themes, to be honest, um, I'll test with, uh, well, you know, Genesis is obviously a big one because we have huge uh, Genesis um, kind of like overlap in our community. So um, making sure things play nice with uh, something, uh, you know, Genesis and some bigger themes like that. In terms of testing plugins, um, you know, on my, on my, on my test sites or my development sites, I just have like, you know, like a, probably like a hundred of the most popular plugins, um, active 
while I'm building. Um, same thing goes for like WordPress core too. Like once they've released the first beta, I'll do all my development on the beta version and it's updates as the release candidates come out so I can catch things um, like that. Uh, you know, the testing process, our, our testing process probably could use some fine tuning and some more automation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time too, we haven't had uh, to, uh, there's never been like any kind of huge conflicts or things like that. I think we try and we, we're very conscientious of like how we play in the WordPress sandbox. Um, so we, you know, we, I think we try not to do things and we know, and, and just from the coming years of experience now where we've seen things and things have come up in support, like caching is a big one. Um, and it still is. I mean, caching can, can be tough, especially, you know, you're making changes to like CSS and JavaScript and, you know, the server's just not wanting to return the updated version. <clears throat> um, but we've seen a lot of things over the years that just kind of now that are built in um, that make it a little bit easier that we don't have to worry about that stuff as much. But yeah, I mean, pretty much just the environment that, that we develop. And when you're talking about, um, you know, plugin and theme conflicts, um, there's obviously different testing that we have, you know, for our own internal code base. Um, that's, you know, more something you'd see like in WordPress core or something like that. But yeah, plugin and theme stuff's just kind of got to catch it. Always have WP debug on. So, uh, you can, you can catch any conflicts in the error logs. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, and I, I think that is a lot of the reason why your particular plugin is so well respected and spoken of in the WordPress community as compared to some of the other page builder plugins that maybe are, um, they're more obtrusive than Beaver Builder is. Beaver Builder is pretty much well known as, as being the least obtrusive um, page building plugin out there. And uh, definitely the one that, you know, we recommend when we recommend page builders for sure. Awesome. Use... Oh, I just want to make one oh, more point to that too. Um, yeah. <clears throat> on like the testing and the plugin compat compatibility is we're actually pretty like friendly with working with other plugin developers too. Like if there's like conflict, like I try not to, a lot of people will have that mentality of like, Oh, it's not our problem. Like go contact the theme author or the plugin developer. But like I, you know, in our culture and, you know, the empathy that we try and put out there, like Robbie is saying, is that we want to work with people. So you may not see a lot of issues too, because like we get, we work to get them resolved, you know, rather than, I mean, there's been some really tricky ones that maybe have gone on for a while and taken a while to get resolved, but definitely try and work with other people instead of saying it's, oh, it's their fault. We're, we, we can't do anything about it. That's the easy way out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, you know, and here's a question too. When you talk about like philosophy, uh, the WordPress community is very developer driven, but the, the people that use WordPress come from all walks. There's people that are complete do it yourselfers. There's people that just use it for content creation and management. Um, but a lot, a lot of the, you know, focus is on the developer end. Now as world, WordPress continues to take more and more of the market share of the website, uh, you know, websites that are being built. Do you see more and more people switching to page builders as opposed to straight development? And do you think that uh, the attitudes of, you know, if you're not building it like from scratch each time in peer development, uh, do you think that that sort of mentality will soften over time? I hope so. For our, I mean, selfishly, yeah, I, I should hope so. <laughs> um, I think it's a kind of natural <clears throat> progression. I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Maybe, you know, analog to digital photography would be a good one. You know, like as technology progresses, things usually get easier um, and take less time um, to go from point A to point B. And you see that a lot in WordPress. I and mean, I used to joke a lot. We had this article or we get people that ask all the time, you know, is, is, is the page builder going to slow down your website? Is it going to affect my SEO? And, and we like, a, well, like, a, you know, do a whole discussion on that. Like we do our best to make it as efficient as possible. And it's very, very close to what you would see if you had hand coded a page. But I always used to joke that, you know, WordPress itself is a shortcut. Like if you really need a hyper efficient page, just like mm. spin it up in HTML and CSS, like, all the technologies that we're using are, are layers on top of other technologies that are, you know, saving us time and, and you're paying for the convenience 
And I definitely think that's going to progress. But I also think there's going to be folks who resist that, you know, the, the kind of old school guys, the old school film photographers that just thought digital was the was the devil. Um, it's kind of I think that's human nature. You know, we're creatures of habit. So that, that's not going to change. But the world keeps keeps moving on. Well, it's funny that you say that, actually, Jim, um, because Chris Lemmer uh, a few weeks ago wrote an article that was around the subject that John asked you um, about what is a true developer. And it's been on, a, on he points out in his article, which we'll put in the show notes, folks, um, ongoing discussion, and it's based on self, the notion of self-worth and how you measure people and their worth. And it's, it's, it's ju- it just doesn't affect WordPress or, e- or coding. It affects all trades and all companies, doesn't it? Um, but there's definitely, um, I think Chris uses the word sub- um, subcontractors. Yeah, I think he uses, might use the word contractors that will develop a site. I think a lot of it's all, uh, I don't know if you would agree, but I think a lot of it's also driven by the, you know, the reality if you have a theme and they don't use a product like you and the, the balance between the stage where you developed a theme so much that you would have been better off just doing a custom build because yeah. you've, you've knocked it around so much that it doesn't work in mobile devices and really you should have done a load of testing and when you start seeing it in all these different devices and it's a mess, um, you realise you would have been better off doing a custom thing. And I think your product and what drives it is a lot around that, um, but I'm not too sure. I don't know if you would agree with that, guys. No, definitely. Like, I think what you were saying about it affects all walks of life and, you know, any career and a lot of, uh, you know, no one wants to, to be obsolete or no one wants to think that, you know, what they spent their time on wasn't necessary. I, this is like another kind of out there analogy, but, you know, Justin and I are both guitar players. And, and I remember when I was learning how to play guitar, um, there was you know, the kind of the school, the classical school of thought that was, you know, you should learn your scales and you should spend your time practicing chords and building up the muscles and you shouldn't worry about learning to play a song like that comes later, you know, like you need to build up the, the core skills first. And, and I was always the type that was like, oh, no way. Like I'm, I want to learn how to play the song. Like, I don't want to know the scale. I don't care about the mode. Like I just want to learn how to riff the solo and, you know, forget that. I'm just going to do the, you know the 20 percent of the work to get you know as far as i can or like the whole 80 20 rule right like you can uh, you can if you're trying to learn a new new skill you can usually just focus on the 20 percent that's going to get you from you know zero well i'm using two number analogies but get you you know a lot closer and a lot less time than if you do the the 80 percent route that that uh maybe would be the more formal and classical way to go about it and in the long run, might even be better. I mean, we've said that a couple times too. You know, a lot of folks are using Beaver Builder in an effort to learn web design, um, or if you, if your goal is to learn the technologies behind WordPress and become a web developer, or you know, get a job or a career as an engineer, you know, Beaver Builder is probably not going to be the best choice for you. Like you're going to the same comes up with like SaaS and CSS. You know, like anyone that's saying if you want to be a web developer you know SaaS is the hot thing or it might not even be SaaS anymore it's been a long time I don't write as much code as I used to but yeah. you know you, you shouldn't learn SaaS before you know CSS if your goal is to learn web technologies because it's a shortcut so it's always kind of that balancing act and the and the, the end goal determines a lot of the you know right process to take I think oh that's fantastic you dealt with one of my multi-level questions with <laughs> uh, ease I'm notorious for that I think we I think <laughs> I think we should wrap up the podcast part of the show, John. Don't you think so? And go on to our bonus content. I do think so. Uh, Just a reminder, if you listeners and viewers out there are getting value from this show, be sure to go to our iTunes, uh, you know, and leave us a review. Leave us a detailed review. We're trying to get to triple digits. Anything you can do can help. And, uh, you know, be sure and, you know, also watch this on the WP Tonic website. Um, 
So with that, I'm going to let everybody tell us where to find them. Robbie, how do we find you? Yeah, our website is wpbeaverbuilder.com. Uh, we're on Twitter. Um, if you want to jump into our community, search for the Beaver Builders group on Facebook. That's probably the best place to, to meet with the, <coughs> the greater Beaver Builder community that we've been talking so highly of this episode. Very good. Justin, how do we find you? Uh, I'm at the same spots that Robbie just mentioned. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a personal Twitter, but I don't use it too much. It's Mr. Justin Busa. If I get more followers, maybe I'll be inclined to start actually tweeting. <laughs> but uh, I want to mention too, uh, uh, we have a Slack group as well, if uh, uh, Beaver Builders Slack group, if Slack's your thing and Facebook isn't. I know some people prefer Slack. That's pretty thriving. There you go. Jonathan, how do we find you? Oh, it's quite easy, folks. You can email me at jonathan at wp-tonic.com. And uh, I'm always happy to have a chat with the listeners or anybody that needs any help. I normally will send you my calendar link and you can book a quick 15 minutes and we can have a chat on Skype. Or um, you can get me on Twitter at Jonathan Denwood. That's my personal one. I have quite a following on that and I'm reasonably active. Um, depending on how stressed I am out, isn't it, John? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And you can find me on my website, which is lockdowndesign.com. You can follow me on Twitter, lockdown underscore, and my Facebook page, just facebook.com slash lockdowndesign. Uh, for the WP Tonic, reminding you, uh, we're going to have episode 148 coming up this Saturday with the panel. We haven't picked a topic yet, but it's going to be awesome, so check it out. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. See you later, folks. Bye. All right. Bye. Yep. And now we're in the bonus content. Yep. So, so you know, how is Mexico? And, uh, you know, uh, you know, people who follow WordPress will know that you guys went to Cabo Press, which is, you know, a thing that Chris Lemma puts on each year. Uh, it's kind of a vacation, but kind of a mastermind. Um. You know, why did you guys sign up? And, you know, what benefits did you get out of it? Well, do you want to take that one, Justin? Or I, got, I got some good stuff, but if you want to jump in first. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's easy to talk about how awesome <laughs> it is. I'm sure Robbie and I could both. Um, I'll just, I'll make it my segment quick and let him spitball on it. But yeah, it's just, a, it's, you know, I mean, it is, I think it's, it's a lot of a mastermind because even though there's the vacation section of it or, you know, aspect of it, even at night when you're hanging out in a hot tub, you know, with uh, Brian, founder of web dev studios, like, you know, like in, or, you know, uh, Chris uh, Wallace or whoever, you know, like there's all these little conversations that you're having and maybe not all of them are, you know, focused around business, but that you know, a lot of that pop, uh, kind of pops up and you're getting a lot of advice and, you know, the mastermind is just weaved into the entire experience. It's not like you just go to like a, a talk and then you're done with it for the day. Um, so, and then, uh, the other big part of it for me too, was the kind of taking us back and looking at the, the, you know, the broader, um, picture, you know, cause we're just in the day to day of everything. And, uh, it gives you a chance to look at it that way and um, and get some insight on it. <laughs> but yeah, I'll let yeah Robbie can. <laughs> well, yeah, was, you you nailed it. Like the WordPress community kind of takes over this uh, this Fiesta Americana Resort. So everywhere you turn, the whole week you're bumping into people from the group, and it's hard not to to chat WordPress. Um, the, the first, so Justin and I went two years in a row. This is our second year. Um, the first year, a couple of guys brought their, their wives. And then this year, a lot more people brought their families and we brought our wives and significant others. But I remember the first year specifically, there was only a couple of, of, you know, outsiders of the community, if you will. But I, I think some of the, some of the spouses were getting really frustrated because all the talk was WordPress all the time. Like it was very little outside of that. Um, one thing that we really gained from it, I think the first year, which inspired us to go back was, and we talked a little bit about this during the podcast, but making the transition from doing the agency work and the product and when to go full time on the product. And it was last year we would, we were about 50, 50 and we were talking to a lot of people who we're running successful WordPress businesses. And I think like Corey Miller in particular was telling us a lot of his stories and, 
And, you know, he's been doing it for years and years. And we kind of realized that there's some longevity to this. Like you know, we were inspired, I guess, by some of the people that we met in the pool. And uh, we also learned so much about how to run and, and manage a business, how to grow a team. And I just can't even begin to, it was like information overload, but we got back and our partner stayed behind Billy. And we were probably just like, we were probably frustrating him. Cause it was just like, every sentence I said was like, well, we learned this thing in Cabo press and like, we should, you know, when we were in Cabo press, we did this and that. And so we were really excited to have the opportunity to bring, uh, to bring him this year and have all three of us there. And then, and then again, yeah, really fortunate that we, we had the idea to bring our, our uh, spouses and significant others. Now it was just, it was a blast. They had blast. We had a blast. Speaking on the spouses too. Um, my like uh, Billy's wife and well, none of our our significant others uh, are in WordPress. And you know, my wife hears about it like you know when she allows me to you know ramble to her. <laughs> um, but you know, she was there and she she knew it was you know our thing that we were doing and, and what it was all about. And it was really cool to like kind of have her immersed in it because you know when we're at the lobby bar, for example, and we're you know just in this deep immersed like WordPress conversation with, you know, a group of WordPress people and she's hanging out, right. She's not just going to walk away. She was, uh, she, she was, you know, immersed in it and it was really cool for her to kind of like get that kind of point of view, look at what we do. And, you know, I'm not just sitting in my office playing on Facebook every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I feel you with that one. Uh, <clears throat> Dustin, my, you know, my significant other too, she's not in WordPress or anything like that. And, Pretty much, but she kind of she kind of knows what I do just because I ramble to her too. Yeah. Uh, you know, a question for both of you too. You know, if if somebody doesn't have the opportunity to go to something like Cabo Press, um, but they you know still are thinking about a mastermind. You know, as as far as that, would you know what kind of benefits do people get from being in a mastermind, and uh you know, just being around other people who have been there before and, and, you know, what kind of things should they look for? Well, okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, again, we're, we were, we're super fortunate to be able to, I mean, that's one of the thoughts that just goes through my head the whole time we're sitting there on the, you know, pristine beach looking at, you know, there were whales breaching this year is like how, how lucky we all are to be in this situation. Um, there's, so, the hosts that Chris brings in, and we, again, we touched on this in the podcast, but we, we read Chris's blog. We got a lot of inspiration. A lot of the discussions that come up are things that these guys like Chris and some of the other hosts are writing about regularly. Um, so yeah, check out who the hosts have been. Like if you're curious about that, but you don't know if you can make it work for whatever reason, um, like guys like Jason Cohen, he's got an amazing blog, a smart bear, and he's yep. been writing for years and years on business. Chris, um, Corey, uh, everyone there, um, Brian from, from uh, studio press, like the, the, all these guys write or speak and all of that information in one form or, you know, a lot of the ideas that were talked about and discussed weren't new ideas and they've all written and spoken about them before. So that'd be a good way to get a, you know kind of get the experience without actually having to buy the plane ticket. Going to reach out to, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times like we forget that we can, we can actually just reach out to these people. Maybe not those people in particular, but there's people that maybe in your, you know, your outer network or things like that, that, you know, you could reach out to that may have, you know, some certain experience in some area of something that you're like wondering about, or you have questions about, but you know, not going at it alone. And, um, uh, like Robbie went to Pressonomics uh, last year and he's, you're, he, I don't, you're still do it, right? You have like the, there's like the group of guys that he does a little mastermind with every week um, that are, you know, business owners. Um, so it's their own personal little mastermind. It doesn't have to be the the top dogs. If you know, you're not going to, it can be, you know, just in your, your network of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, to be brutally honest, the term mastermind, I think it encompasses a lot and I'm, I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of it. Like it feels really pretentious whenever <laughs> I'm trying to explain to someone like, like, Oh, like, yeah, I'm doing my mastermind. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> I, it's, I understand, but, but yeah, so I met these guys in uh, Pressonomics and I, I believe the format is based off of something called the EO group, but I don't know what that acronym is. 
Um, but real quickly, we just get on a call once a month and it's a structured conversation where we talk about the best and worst things that have happened in our business. We set goals and then we have a discussion that revolves around a certain issue that each one of us is dealing with in our business. And following that format, it kind of gives you the opportunity to learn about everyone, both their business and their kind of personality. It's like, you know, forcefully making friends in a way. Um, but it's been a great resource for me to, to be able to talk out some of the issues that we have, both on the business and personal side with other people that are, that are going through the same thing. And, and the guys I, that I jumped in with were all kind of in similar places in our, our lives and our businesses. Um, so yeah, finding someone that's kind of around the same stage as you and, and getting them on a regular call and just chatting with people. And it, it, it I wish it came more naturally, but having a structured format and I think it's EO maybe I can look it up and try and get it to you guys for the show notes so we can put it in there but because I don't remember exactly yeah. what the format's called but it's definitely a structured uh, structured tried and true methodology for managing and, and hosting one of those cool sounds great Jonathan anything else yeah I think you know um, I don't know if you you want to um, answer this particular question. So, what what are the future plans? You know, you know, you've got this um, really fantastic product, but um, have you got a vision where you want to take the company in the next year, eighteen months? Uh, are you going to broaden the product out, or are you just you think in the next year you're just going to concentrate on you know, improving a really excellent product even more? Well, we're actually in the middle of <clears throat> improving the product. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, we, we're still kind of fleshing out our, our, our long-term kind of vision. I, I, well, I, domination. Yeah, well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> A beaver sticker on every laptop. <laughs> um, but we are, we're, we're kind of, it, it's a hard question to answer because we're like in the trenches right now on some really big stuff. So I feel like we're actually, we're, we're, we're in the midst of working on like a big long-term goal right now, um, both in improving the product and then also kind of broadening what it can do from um, the one we've been pretty transparent about is the theme building where it's not just building a page where you can actually do things like, um, you know, build your archive pages or, you know, use Beaver Builder to, to build your post layouts. Um, but you don't actually use Beaver Builder to build the individual posts. You just build one layout, and then you hook up, you know, the post title and the post content. Maybe your featured images, the row background, things like that. You can build your site header, footer. Um, you know, you can have different headers for different pages, and all, I mean, you don't have to do all that stuff. It's but it's flexible enough to do all this kind of powerful theme building stuff. So we're in the we're in the midst of that, and then also um, improving the product. You know, the last like three years worth of you know feedback that we've gotten. Um, you know, customer pain points and whatnot. And then also the third party stuff that we didn't realize was going to come in. So we're, uh, we're, uh, we have a guy who's working on a big UI refresh for us right now too. So yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of in the midst of some big stuff. I, I feel like once we get closer to those being done, we can start to really look at some more long-term plans, but it's just so much, it's so hard to swallow, like thinking of like, what are we going to do next? I'm like, oh, we're doing so much right now. <laughs> so just, uh, just a little bit. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> that seem, uh, do you ever sleep? <laughs> I, I try. No, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't. Poor guy. <laughs> it, it does, that's a, all right. I, I think we've, um, what do you reckon, John? I think that's enough yeah. bonus content. We covered some good yeah, stuff. Yeah, totally. We? we want to be respectful of your guys' time and let you get on with your day. But yeah, definitely. But, um, I've really enjoyed the um, conversation, guys. You you come across really um, cool cats. And um, I think you, you, know, you should be really so proud of what you've built. It's really cool. And um, you just come across really nice people. So there we are, John. Unlike me, my, I'm just a grumpy English person, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, so thanks, no, guys. It's, it's no, been a lot, of fun, a lot of fun. This is, this is really fun. Right. Yeah, right back okay. at you. This has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for hosting and, and moderating. Uh, yeah, you guys did a that – was, that was wonderful. I, some of the things that we're, we're talking about, I never would have guessed would have come up. But 
Um, and thank you so much for the the kind words and the plugs too. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. It's really yeah, good. I'm going to oh, no be. Problem. I'm going to, um, folks. They they've been kind enough to give me a full copy, and uh, I said, all right, um, I'm, it's going to be about page builders in general. Another article, but it's going to be longer <laughs> than our panel. We've got a panel member, Brian Jackson, who does these fantastic reviews, and I'm I'm just going to outright him this time, John. I'm determined to do it, John. You better get your Wheaties, <laughs> man, because Brian Brian just goes and goes. <laughs> all right i'm gonna i'm gonna let you guys go and and you know and i'll catch up with you guys i'm sure i'll see you um yeah. you know in the yeah. neighborhood at the meetup or whatever or something like that okay yeah definitely okay yeah, all right thanks guys Stay on, Jonathan. thanks yeah. thank you